morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time of day it is, wherever you are right now. Thank you for tuning in to the Conversations with Dr. Don Show. The show is produced and broadcast from the Portland, Oregon, USA area. And for your first time viewers, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique, one of a kind individuals and about what we've decided to talk about tonight, and we'll be talking about where we are now on climate change with Dirk Dunning. Dirk Dunning. Oh, you're on again. Hey, Don. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good to see you. You got your nice sun shades on because... Well, I'm destroyed by all the LED lights. Yes. Absolutely destroyed by them. So my apologies, but these are actually not sunglasses. I They're know. blinds. Mm -hmm. that they don't let any light through at all. Hey. But when you reach for my hand, you missed it. <laughs> well, that's what happens when you're a blind person. Yeah, 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 yeah. So how are you feeling this evening? I feel great. How about you? Uh, nearly great. Good. <laughs> and it's always interesting to see where we start from without even starting the, 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 the show because your mind's just all over the darn place and <laughs> you're never at a loss for information or research. And Thank you. And you go so far beyond what's known about the human brain, and I don't <laughs> want to go there. <laughs> uh, the, far, the farthest I go there is meditation, those kinds of things. Oh, yeah. that's a great fun thing. Yeah. Anyhow, so let's do the basic bio of who you are. And even though you talked about it before, you've got some new viewers to see this show. Certainly. And if I were to ask your best friend, who is Dirk? What would your best friend say? Who is Dirk? Well, I've actually given that some thought since the last time we chatted, and I think... Be your best friend. Well, I think one of the things is, as a best friend, I am a best friend. I, I had not realized some things happened in my life, and I was telling some of my friends just how much I appreciated them, about what amazing friends they were, and I heard back the same. Uh -huh. and. That was something I hadn't really thought about for my impact on others and how that all works. But uh -huh. uh, I truly do have amazing friends, and they think the same of me, which is great. Uh, but now you're talking in terms of, of Dirk now, right? not your best friend. Yeah. And, but in terms of myself, you know, I, I was born in Ellensburg, Washington, did all kinds of things in the technical world. Um, <laughs> I had a very unusual and amazing career, managed to do great stuff. But really where I ended up going was into a lot of different kinds of areas where those are the areas my friends know me better in dealing with um, energy healing or deep meditation work or all kinds of things of that nature. All kinds of psi stuff, which is a lot of fun. Energy healing. See, you're starting off already before you even get started on the show. You've got so many ideas and so many things. And each time when I try to, to challenge you or test you, you always run away with it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so when and where were you born? Uh, Ellensburg, Washington, 1955. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, grew up very briefly there. I can remember a little bit in Ellensburg, a little bit in Yakima. But when I was quite young, we moved to Portland, Oregon, actually out towards Gresham, uh, in an area called Rockwood. And so for me, I grew up in Rockwood, and I, I I grew accustomed to hearing the fir trees and the wind whistling in them in the winter. And, you know, 60 mile an hour winds were not uncommon. That was my lullaby. <laughs> uh -huh. And now I live in Salem at the moment, and I'll hear people talk about a horrible storm that's coming in with wind speeds of 25 or 30 miles an hour. It's like, <laughs> that's not even a good breeze. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I grew up in the East County and, and loved it and get, grew quite used to it. And so that kind of changes where you're at. Uh -huh. But you have memories back of where you grew up. Yeah, actually, well, my first memory actually is my folks didn't have a lot of money when I was young, and I grew up in what amounted to a suitcase or a dresser drawer. There were both that my dad put screens over the top. And my first memory is our cat, Yehudi, sitting on top of the screen, purring, and drooling on me when I was about one year old. <laughs> Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was great. <laughs> so, why were you born? That, you know, as mm. we discussed last time, that's uh, something yes. I've given a fair amount of thought. 
Um, in my family, we had all kinds of interesting things happen, and I think each of us came into the world to support each other in very interesting and unique ways. But also, in my case, I also came into the world for a lot of reasons dealing with trying to resolve issues and solve problems in a very large way. And I've had the great opportunity to do that in my life, or who knows, maybe it's the other way around. I had the opportunity, and so therefore, one of the things in doing the deep meditative work, it becomes a real question of a chicken and an egg. What actually came first? So is that why you were born? It's what I think. Uh-huh. Yeah. Actually, it's what I feel. Uh-huh. What's the difference between feeling and thinking? Oh, that's huge. So a lot of the world, people work from an emotional base in feeling. Um, in a less significant part of the world, not significant, in a lesser grouping of the world, people work and think out of, emo or, uh, out of logical thought rather than emotion. And the kind of things you get, and, and this has been a big thing for me, is that as a kid, I didn't understand. I never experienced the emotions of anger or shame. They weren't a part of who I was. Never? Never. Not until the last few years. And I've, to this day, never experienced the emotion of shame. I know it logically. I don't know the emotion. What's changed between back before and then the last few years? You said the last few years. Well, the last few years, what happened with anger and with and that is anger is associated with a particular fear for your own physical safety. Even though I had horrible things happen in my life, you know, dread arthritis that you could relate to of things that tried to kill me for a long time. Um, I was in bone crushing pain for over 30 years with the arthritis before I cured it. And I did all kinds of interesting things in industry where I was exposed to huge hazards and walked away from those. How'd you cure the arthritis? I'm sorry, I'm digressing here. No, it's okay. <laughs> uh, well, let me finish on the anger of first. Of course, please. So with fear and anger, concern of your own physical safety, in the last couple of years, the LED lights really did a number on me. And that actually gave me great concern for my own physical well welfare for the rest of my life about what's going to happen in the world. Because I can't go into shops. I can't even go to the doctors anymore without going in as a blind person. Um, if I go into stores that have LED lights, I have to wear blue blocking glasses, run in, grab the things I need, and run out, and even then I will be harmed. So that led me to actually fearing for my own safety for the first time in my life. That triggering, that fear, led to anger for the first time in my life. It's not a good emotion. I don't like it. Mm. Shame, as, I, as best I can relate shame, it's related to the something similar where your concern is about your own emotional safety mm -hmm. and your own emotional well-being. If you have no concerns for your own emotional safety, there can't be shame. One of the interesting things with uh, fear is that if you don't have a fear for your own physical safety, one of the side effects, oddly enough, is that you end up being innately happy. And so you do things like come in in the morning to work and say, good morning. And people say, what the hell is so good about it? And it's like, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it's a strange thing. Well, anyway, I did not know that through most of my life until way late, which gives me an interesting different perspective. People like me who run through that have the interesting problem that we can walk into emergencies and deal with them with not, no real problem. Whereas people who strongly feel fear for their own physical safety have a tendency to lock up and freeze. And so it's common for engineers, for emergency responders, firefighters, perhaps police, military, to be in the world that I was in where you don't have a fear for your own safety and you don't suffer anger particularly. That's not always the case, but it happens a lot of the time. Um, for the arthritis, curing the arthritis. So the arthritis I had, um, there's three different names for it. One starts at the, at the feet and works up. The other starts at the, sp the lower spine and works up. And the third is on the inside of the spine. And they're reactive arthritis or writer's disease, ankylosing spondylitis, and also... I, I think that one. <laughs> you understand that one. Mm -hmm. and another one called diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis, otherwise known as DISH. Mm -hmm. And what it means is that a good deal of my spine has been fused to solid bone by the disease. And this happened over about 30 years. And what it did is it turned the tendons on the inner face of the spine to solid bone. The, the areas between the vertebrae also fused to solid bone, so I have a permanent forward bend that I can't undo. Um, 
And that makes things for, diff for great difficulty, where I, I have limited ability to turn my neck, so I have to turn my whole body Me instead, too. and you can relate. Yeah. Well, part of understanding that disease, because it was definitely trying to kill me, was understanding that it's actually caused by a set of microorganisms. And once I knew that with pretty good certainty, I went through a process of using a range of antibiotics to ensure that whatever the bug was, it was dead. And they typically, by the way, live in the intestines. Once that was done, I ended up going through about two years of eating Indian curry twice a day, Kashmiri curry, as it turns out. And the Indian curries have a number of herbs in them, cardamom, coriander, cumin, fennel, and turmeric particularly, but also others that are powerful anti-inflammatories, and they help heal the intestinal lining and regrow it. After those two things, the disease is still going on because what's happened is the body sees the bugs, attacks them, and screws up and attacks the body as it's doing that. Once the bug is gone, there isn't the active mechanism to relearn that, but the body still remembers and it's still trying to fight what it thinks is an infection. And so this is where the deep meditation comes in of trying to quiet your mind enough that you can actually change your immune system so that it quits attacking. And once you do that, the arthritis goes away. Is what you're talking about now in print somewhere? It's not in print anywhere. One of the things that I need to do is write up the story of what I did and how it happened. This, that part of the story of my life is a big one for people to, not just for the diseases you and I have, but other people, to find ways that they can help themselves beyond what the medical community knows. I'm not hearing what you're talking about now uh, anywhere where it's, it's in and, and it's not in, form, print. not in print. Huh? Um, there was a brief time in the 1990s. There's a website called fpnotebook.com, Family Practice Notebook. It's a wonderful crib site for doctors where it, if you don't read um, medical techno babble, it's a hard site to use. But if you go there, you can find things like writer's disease where it will tell you what the criteria are, what the things are that are like it, what you do to treat it, and what the complications are. All of that is there but it's done in a very abbreviated format. There's not a long discussion. It's just, you know, three by five card kind of explanation for a doctor. There are only about three or five uh, people in 100,000 that, that has the ability <laughs> to read them. Huh? It, it's not quite that hard, but, <laughs> but the thing what, that it did is, in the 1990s, there was a recognition that there were, beginning in the 1970s, there was a, an American, I think it was a destroyer, but it may have been a cruiser, that made a port call in, I think, Singapore, somewhere in Southeast Asia. And when the sailors came back to the boat, a large number of them had venereal disease, and a large number of them had writer's disease, which is a kissing cousin of ankylosing spondylitis. Mm -hmm. um, R-Y-D-E-R? R-E-I-T-E-R, apostrophe uh, S. Yeah. Uh, writer was a German Nazi, and as a consequence, nobody wants to use his name anymore. So today they call it reactive arthritis. Um, anyway, reactive arthritis, in the 70s they began to realize, by the 90s they did understand that it was caused by the body's reaction to an infection. And then trying to resolve that became a big thing. Well, the problem is it's hard to kill the bug, it's hard then to, to quiet the immune system, and it didn't take them too long before they gave up on that route. And even though it was right, they stopped pursuing it. So today, if you look up for either writer's disease, reactive arthritis, or ankylosing spondylitis, what they do is the old treatments of anti-inflammatories, powerful painkillers, opiates, um, some really strange drugs, and immune system suppressants, as well as now the immunologic agents, where they intentionally destroy a part of your immune system. And they, they destroy your your stomach also with the anti-inflammatories. The anti-inflammatories do that, and, and not just the stomach, also the gut. Yeah. Um, the anti-inflammatory I was taking for a decade, it really does a number on the gut. But in Indifin? Uh No, actually meclamine, meclofenamate sodium. Um, meclamine is a weird one that it does both ends of both the production and the use of one of the, it's called E2 prostaglandin. And what it is is an inflammatory um, chemical within the body. E1 prostaglandin is used to protect the stomach. E2 is used elsewhere in the body, but what meclamin does is suppress it completely, and what happened then is my intestines went to being more acidic than coffee. 
Um, needless to say, that does a number on the intestinal lining, and I did that for a decade. Um, but I had to. I had no choice. I was in a horrible way. And as you can probably relate, I had over 200 cortisone injections over those 30 years, which nobody should ever have to do that. And yet, you, when I said uh, to you, how are you doing this evening, and you said fine. Not fine. I'm doing great. <laughs> so in September of 1997, I cured the arthritis, truly cured it. In, in one day, actually in one hour, I went from high-dose anti-inflammatories to none. And I have not had to take them again ever since. It's an interesting time to, to be able to live in a time free of pain when you spent three decades in horrible pain. I uh, also learned the last year, it's been kind of funny, I did a whole bunch of genetic testing, more so than you're going to find common over the market stuff. Sure. And I learned that I am missing five particular enzymes. They just don't work in me. One of them is the enzyme that converts codeine into morphine. It also converts tramadol and Vicodin into their active forms. Because I don't have that, all the codeine that I took for all of those years was nothing but a placebo. It didn't do a thing. I might as well have eaten the bottle. So, you know, for me, the opiates in the form of codeine and Vicodin are not addictive because they don't do anything for me. On the other hand, morphine I always thought was too strong, so I never took that, even though I had prescriptions for it. Nothing in between. No, it was a big step from one to the other. Mm. Well, now I don't need any of that, so it's a good thing. What do you eat? <laughs> this is another <laughs> is there fascinating anything that you, thing. you, you say for I, well, right now I'm carrying too much weight. I went through a, a bout with a hernia and some other things that had me doing less exercise than I should. Um, but what ended up happening is that I learned, when I first started working on Hanford issues, I was at a meeting, one of the, actually I think it was the very first meeting up at Hanford, and they were arguing about how much fish goes into the dietary model for radionuclide exposure. And the researchers wanted to argue for 39 grams a week. That's crazy. The tribes wanted 250 grams a day, which would be, was that, a quarter of a pound a day. And I'm th I, I, I was busy doing some calculations, and I realized, wait a minute, I'm averaging a pound a day of salmon myself every day, and I had for all of my life. So to answer your question, I'm a pessivore. I eat fish. That's my number one thing. Uh -huh. But also lots of vegetables and green leafies and whatnot, and then a variety of other things added to that. But principally, I'm a fish eater and always have been. But that also has a lot of other effects that are quite good. And as it turned out, that helped me with the arthritis and I never knew it. And your arthritis free now? Yep, it's gone. You know, there's the leftover bone deposits. My sacroiliac joints are fused shut. A good deal of my spine is solid bone. But otherwise, I'm in a great place. <laughs> you know, there's things I can't physically do and now Particularly with the LEDs, I can't work anymore. But other than that, I'm in a great place. So, and, and, and a few words. Why were you born? <laughs> well, like I say, um, perhaps as an example of what can be done, I, I, I think there were a lot of things I was set in the world to accomplish, mm -hmm. and I did a lot of them. Um, I was very much involved in, actually probably the principal, and getting MTBE banned from gasoline, which it turned out, had it continued with leaks into groundwater and into drinking water systems, likely would have killed tens of millions of people. I was the person who found the problem at the K Basins at Hanford, that resolving that resolved. And you mentioned Hanford twice, so mm -hmm. you're going to need to say a few words about that, please, okay. for the viewers. So Hanford is a 500, well, was a 560 square mile area in uh, eastern Washington state. Mm -hmm. It was the home to the Hanford Works where the U.S. government produced 67 metric tons of plutonium and a metric ton of uranium-233. This is where the bulk, about two-thirds of the weapons plutonium came from in the United States. They ran nine reactors along the river to produce the plutonium and they created a huge amount of waste, a lot of which ended up going into the soil and a huge amount is still in tanks. Nine reactors? Why nine reactors? Um, they kept building more as the 1960s and 70s ramped up. 
we went through from the 40s, 50s through the 60s this idea that we had to have more to beat the Russians. Okay. And the Russians did the same thing, and it was a tit-for-tat that we both increased until each country had over 30,000 nuclear weapons worth of plutonium. Actually, more than 30,000 nuclear weapons, much more plutonium than that. And when you actually look back on it, it was entirely crazy because just a few thousand nuclear weapons is enough to end the world as we know it. Mm -hmm. the, you know, it was immense overkill. But the idea was more is better, and they just... Mm -hmm. They just kept producing more. So Hanford now is not safe and it's dangerous where it is on the Columbia River. It is. Hanford was shut down about 1980-something, 80 89 particularly, and, and all of the operations ceased not long after that. Uh, they had some attempts at restarting some aspects of it for a brief time, but mostly it's been long shut down. But the waste continue to be there. Mm -hmm. um, they dumped a, a thousand tons of chlorinated solvent to the soil in the middle of the site with a lot of plutonium in it. They dumped, oh, I forget what the number is, it's tens of millions of gallons of radioactive waste into the tanks. It's 149 single shell, 18 double shell tanks, all of which are ancient and rotting. One of the double shell tanks has already failed. Um, it's a huge problem that requires billions of dollars a year just to stand in place and not get anywhere. How long would it take for that uh, to dissipate or disappear from the face of the earth? Um, you can't count that high. The, um, the radioactivity that's there will be there long after man is gone. Uh, plutonium has a half-life of 23,500 some odd years and it takes on the order of 10 or 20 half-lives to get down to where it's essentially meaningless particularly given the quantities, more like 30 half-lives. What that means is you're looking at, just for that, um, 300 or 700,000 years at least, so little, just to get rid of the plutonium. It's a little while, isn't it? A little while. <laughs> now, for the really radioactive stuff, the cesium, the strontium, the others, they'll essentially be gone in maybe 1,000 to 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. But when you look at some of the longer life stuff, the hazards into the Columbia River will, they're actually at one of the lower points now, they will continue to increase and be at some higher levels four, five, six thousand years from now. And that's if they do all the cleanup that they plan to do. If they don't do it right, well, the levels will be higher. Now, I have a, a friend of yours from years <laughs> ago, and I'm not thinking of his name right now because your mind's got, my, my mind is going forever, and I can't think of his name now. Uh, remember? Well, there may be several. Um, uh, could be Ralph Pat, who is the one who led me to go to work for the state. Uh, could be Ken Niles, Tom Stoops, Dale Engstrom. There's a whole group of people that have worked very hard for a lot of years. The whistleblower, I think. Uh, at oh, yes. Uh, you're thinking of, um, oh shoot, I can see him. There, there's Big several guy. Of them. Yeah, there's several of them in particular, but I know the one you're thinking of. Yeah. Um, Lloyd Marbet. Lloyd Marbet. we got to do it. <laughs> a lot more bad. <laughs> yeah. He's but a fun guy. Anyhow, let's go on a little bit because we're stuck here for a minute, but it's so interesting. Uh, religious, uh, national, uh, cultural heritage. Oh, you always go to this one. My mm -hmm. religious background is I was given a choice as a child, as my parents were before them, or uh -huh. before me, of deciding what it was I believed. And I essentially decided I didn't believe any of what I found out there. And so you might think that as a, a teenager, I was for all the world atheist. And for a good deal of my life, that was true. In the last decade or actually two decades or so, the answer is much more complicated. Um, I've done a lot of things that in deep meditative work where I've done things of retrieving people who've passed on and gotten stuck, you know, talking with folks who've passed on and doing all kinds of other things that they defy the simple ideas about what's going on and how religion works. Uh-oh, tilt. <laughs> no. uh, we can't go beyond that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, please. <laughs> but if you need to go on beyond that, go ahead. No, that's fine. All right. And when your cultural heritage and a religious preference and you don't have a religion, you don't have a religion nowadays. So cultural heritage, one of the things in the genetics that's been interesting is on both sides of my family, it looked like in family stories, which is quite often true, mm -hmm. that about third grandparent or so, particularly third grandmother, 
that there might be Native American. Turned out that's not true at all, and the genetics show absolutely zero Native American heritage. Mm. However, on the flip side, I also learned, going back through my genealogy, that I am directly descended of um, William Brewster, who was the pastor on the Mayflower. And through one of his descendants, I am also then descended of the, uh, the last of the chiefs of the Choan Nation, Thomas Hoyter. And so, so you got a conflict uh, in, in between your heritage? Well, the genetics say that there's no genetics from the Native Americans. However, the genealogy says, yeah, I am descended directly from some folks who were tribal. It doesn't mean much. That's from the historical record. Right. Now, on the flip side, when you look at my genetics, it's interesting, and this is true of lots of Europeans. Um, we share DNA that comes from people who lived in central Siberia 45,000 years ago. These are people who went both to Europe and over the ice bridge to the Americas. They are the ancestors of the Native Americans, particularly of the Clovis people. And so when you look at you know, a Clovis boy who died in Montana 12,000 years ago, I have a lot of genetic overlap with him, which is fascinating and completely meaningless. <laughs> but how much of this is a creation in your own mind, because your mind is so busy and active, and so you needed to fill some uh, blank spaces? <laughs> <laughs> it's just more stuff to follow and see how things work. <laughs> yeah. Particularly, I started chasing it down, not for any of those reasons. I yeah. started chasing it, trying to understand, where did my arthritis come from? And as it turns out, the genetics that cause the arthritis that we both have actually come from Neanderthals, from ancient humans that were cousins of humanity. And it's a, very ex it's a very wonderful, actually, set of genetics that supports the immune system, but it has a downside. And the downside is that they had bacteria that live with them and developed along with them that learned how to attack them. And so it's a double-edged sword. We're going to keep moving on here. Your, your formal education, um, you, you touched on it a moment ago. Originally chemical engineer out of Oregon State. Mm -hmm. Then I uh, made the obvious decision to go to work for Westinghouse and learn how to run nuclear submarines and to train sailors to run nuclear submarines for a couple of years. Then I kind of turned sideways and became an environmental engineer and then ultimately a semiconductor engineer and a manager in semiconductor. I was manager of chemical operations for the better part of a decade in Puyallup, Washington, where I learned all about how to build computer chips and related as well as you know, designing ultra-high purity systems of all kinds of, of different natures, toxic gases, toxic chemicals, high purity water, you name it. Are we going to freeze uh, your genetic makeup? For <laughs> <laughs> nah, <laughs> nobody would want it. Okay. And uh, you retired now for some? Retired for two years now. Mm -hmm. Actually, yeah, 2017, so two years, about What's the date today, the 26th? Yeah. 25 days ago, two years ago. Uh -huh. What are you doing, are you enjoying your retirement? I'm having a fabulous time. Uh -huh. it, it's funny, retirement is an odd thing. It takes you the first year to get over the idea of working, uh -huh. and then you're still recovering a little bit from that, and there finally comes some point in there where you forget that you ever worked. <laughs> have you reached that point yet? Oh yeah, long ago, <laughs> and it's a wonderful thing. You have a partner. I don't at the moment, no. Uh-huh. Are you available for a, a future partner? Yeah. Well, you look at the uh, camera and say, here I am, here I am, <laughs> folks. <laughs> Actually, well, we'll see. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren? None of my own. I have a nephew. Um, he's great. Mm -hmm. um, he's actually got, I think, four, five kids. Mm -hmm. And so that part of our family is taken care of. My brother and sister both passed, as have my dad and mom, so it's just me now. Just you, huh? Yep. Yeah, I'm the last of the Mohicans myself, huh? It's a strange thing. Political persuasion, your left, right, center are all over the place. I don't really fit well. Um, as much as anything, probably progressive, though I got along really great with um, the Republicans of the 1970s in Oregon, which is not anything like today. Right. You know, this is the Tom McCall kind of branch of yeah. Oregon politics. Yeah. On the other hand, I, you know, there's most of the different branches I have disagreement with. 
And what I find that's more important is to sit down with people and find out where you have common ground and build from there. Mm -hmm. That's hugely important. And our, our similarities and commonalities are far more important than our differences. Can you s take just a few minutes because we will have to stop you along with the next question here. Memberships in the political, social, or civic organizations. Because of what I did for a living, I intentionally stayed away from any of that. Also stayed away from social media, which actually has turned out to be a great benefit. Um, <laughs> it, it keeps you in the world of the sane when you don't do that stuff. Okay, persons from the past <laughs> or alive today that you admired or look up to any names come to mind besides Lloyd Morbett? <laughs> <laughs> well, number one for me is, is my folks, particularly my dad and mom. I was just like, wow. My dad was amazing and so was my mom in, in very different ways. Uh, in the world that people know, um, there's so many. And, and you know, I've, I've mentioned many to you before that kind of surprised you. Sure. Some of the more interesting ones to me are Nikola Tesla, mm -hmm. truly astounding guy. Um, Oh, who else? Judith Resnick would be one that po folks might not recognize. She was one of the astronauts on, on the shuttle that blew up, the first one. Yes. Amazing lady. Absolutely astounding. Um, one that I just learned about and I've been fascinated by is Sojourner Truth. Hmm. Um, turns out my mom's mom, my grandmother, <laughs> she was a sojourner in the 1920s. Sojourner Truth was a freed black slave who was an abolitionist and a woman suffragette uh -huh. in the 1920s. Well, how did you get your brain power from <laughs> your mom or your dad or both? I, I think it's both. That's also been something I've been trying to track down on the genetics and find out. You know, this this isn't my doing. It's I got this from somewhere. My dad always speculated it came from the Bledsoe side of the family, but it's from both sides. Mm -hmm. Um, it also turns out it's probably related to some of the genetic differences about enzymes, oddly enough. And the strangest of the strange, it looks like a huge part of that again comes from the Neanderthals, where the Neanderthal people lived in the far north of Europe. They had to adapt to live in conditions that were dark a good deal of the year. Mm -hmm. So they needed to see in the dark really well, and they needed to see movement in the dark well. To do that, one of the things they needed was a brain that ran really fast. Mm -hmm. And so the genetics developed to support that as well as a much larger visual cortex and other things. And is that where it came from? I don't know. But I suspect that may be where a large part of it comes from. I think we're running out of time because they're going to be yelling at me because okay. we're spending so much time here. And it's time for take take a break here and as usual, the mics will be off. Okay, we're back, and thanks for staying tuned. And for you viewers who missed the opening of the show, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one-hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people, like most of you out there, about who they are as unique, one-of-a-kind individuals, and about whatever it is we decided to talk about tonight. We'll be talking about where we are now on climate change. And boy, that's a big subject, climate change. And yes. Dirk Dunning, your particular view on climate change. So let's move right into the prompting questions. And you want to start something off with uh, a few comments about climate change before we go into the questions? So climate change is the singular most important thing in the world today. Mm -hmm. 
because of all of the huge amount of emission of carbon dioxide and methane that we've had from industry over all these years, you know, from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution till now, it's the foundation of what has driven our economy. Um, and the folks who particularly profit from using that energy don't want to give up those profits. Mm -hmm. And so there's a huge financial engine at stake in trying to prevent change. Yet at the same time, the buildup of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and methane has pushed the atmosphere very hard to reflecting heat back to the earth and causing warming of the surface. But it's happening at such a rate that you know, the, the language that people use no longer is really about warming. It's about catastrophic climate change because well, it's happening that fast. What about the Amazonian rainforest being destroyed, being burned away now? So that's where we get to the, the present day. The present day we've got a huge number of things that are happening that are all completely terrible. Uh, the Amazon right now has close to 80,000 fires burning in the forests of the Amazon. Uh, the new president of Brazil, Jair Balasano, I think that's how you pronounce his name. Anyway, he um, particularly is along the lines of Donald Trump or Blair Johnson in England. They're not believers in climate change. Not believing in it doesn't make it not real. Yes. And so the big thing for the folks in Brazil the has been... The evidence is there. It is. It, and the big thing for the folks in Brazil has been to try to pump their economic engine. And a way that they've chosen to do that is by cutting down forests in the Amazon and supporting farmers and other folks who are moving into the forests in building the economy of Brazil. By raising beef. By raising beef primarily, but a lot of other things as well. Unfortunately, when they cut down the forest and burn it down, the land is only productive for a few years. The land there is very skimpy in terms of the amount of soil that's actually present. The forest is built on a thin skin. And as a consequence, they keep needing to burn down more forest and move on to new land in order to keep the production that they had. And as they do that, and as the fires now have started building, it is basically burning out the lungs of the earth. The forests of the Amazon are one of the huge places on earth that the earth produces oxygen. That and the oceans and the great boreal forests, the forests of Canada and Russia, Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, all of those are burning to great degree and have huge insect infestations because of the warming of the climate and what that's done to the trees. Uh, in Siberia, a lot of the tundra, which has been permafrost for as long as anybody can remember and far back into the record, the, the tundra has caught fire and has been burning in massive ways, releasing both methane and carbon dioxide. Um, the changes are just astounding. There's even this year been massive fires on Greenland, of all places. Mm -hmm. um, and humans have been the primary uh, cause of this? Uh, humans are both directly and indirectly the cause. So as an example, in Canada, a lot of the fires are occurring because as the world warmed and as insects started attacking the trees, the trees died. Large areas of dead forest are prime places to have fire. And so you have lightning strikes and other things will start a fire and then they're extremely hard to put out. Um, there's also the, the coal tar sands in central Canada where they've been busy mining on the surface for fossil fuels. And in those areas they've had truly devastating fires in the last couple of years. Um, the same thing is holding all over the northern hemisphere of the world. And it's, it's just absolutely atrocious. So there's no question about climate change is occurring. Oh, no question at all. The, you know, there, there may be those who want to not believe it, but it's only that they want not to believe it. The scientific evidence is in. The scientific evidence is absolutely clear. We're seeing already massive changes in the flow of air in our atmosphere as we lose the ice in the North Pole, as more and more of it melts each year we end up reaching a place where there isn't the cold to cause the air to fall in the Arctic. And when you don't have that and you have the heating occurring at the equator, things slow down and stall and the jet stream slows down and becomes more wiggly. As the jet stream becomes more wiggly, we have cold systems that move way north and warm systems, I'm sorry, warm systems move way north and cold systems that move yeah. way south. And so you have all kinds of changes in weather and climate that we've never seen before. Um, 
And then we have really strange things happen in the ocean as well. As, as the ice has melted off, and there is not the ice to melt throughout the year, that reduces the driving force to turn over the ocean, the great oceanic circulation. And one of the things that comes from that then is seeing a potential for the, the Gulf Stream, the great warm current that starts in the Caribbean and then moves up the eastern coast of the United States. It goes ultimately all the way north past Iceland, and there the cold water falling from the melting ice acts as the driving force to pull it northward. So this is a cause of, this is an example of what's happening because of climate change. Correct. The that, climate is changing. And that is slowing down. As the oceans turn, as, as the current slows down, all kinds of other things happen. Um, the oxygen levels in the water fall and fish no longer can live in the same places. Uh, in the Pacific, one of the things that we see is they've seen giant sunfish. These are very interesting fish. Mm -hmm. They're normally off the coast of California. They've seen them as far north as Alaska now. Um, but a lot of the fish don't know how to behave when the temperatures change like that. And so their hunting grounds have moved on them as other fish have moved and other sea creatures and plankton and, and such. And as that's happened, their entire life cycle is disrupted. Add to that the huge fishing fleets that have been decimating the oceans, and what you end up with is a collapse of the fisheries, which isn't just about food, it's about the health of the ocean itself. And so all over the world we see these impacts, and they're terrifying, frankly. Um, this year, in looking at the Arctic ice, there's a whole group of folks who watch the Arctic ice very closely, trying to understand what's happening, scientists in particular, but also a lot of others. And in 2007 and 2012, there were very severe melts in the Arctic ice. Well, you know, was, I'm interrupting you because I was Thanks. thinking, of, uh, where am I going to go if Trump keeps going, the Trump cult is, is going, and I was planning on leaving the U.S. of A. and go north or some other place on the, on the globe while well, escaping climate change. A lot of people have considered this. Um, there is one of the folks who did a lot of research, Guy McPherson, who was asked that question, and, and he particularly goes off on a far end of predicting human extinction within the decade. Um, within the decade? Within the decade. In, and I think there's a fallacy in what he describes there, but it's not to get into that. Is sure. That um, one of the things the guy talked about was he had several folks, one of them was a billionaire, who particularly wanted to know the answer to the question you just asked. Where can I go to escape climate change? Yeah. And he suggested Tasmania, <laughs> south of Australia. And so the guy moved his entire operation to Tasmania. <laughs> did he really? He did. Um, but the reality is we only have one Earth. There is no Earth B. There's no alternate plan that we all of us will go together in whatever happens on the Earth. We don't get to choose to escape it to anywhere. And even if we could, let's say that through some miracle the southern hemisphere would be safe and the northern hemisphere could roast. Even in those circumstances, you can't take the entire population of the Earth and put it in the southern hemisphere. It won't work. And so you only have some who might be able to go to refuge. But it's a false refuge even at that. One of the things we see now is the great glaciers of Antarctica are melting like crazy. And on the West Antarctic uh, Peninsula, they're seeing an imminent failure of a massive ice sheet that has the potential to cause a significant rise in ocean levels. Uh -huh. Likewise, there's a couple of others that are, are showing signs of similar things around Antarctica. This is the single coldest, biggest place on Earth, and even it's showing massive changes. And they're surprising. One of the things they've seen is that the warm ocean waters are invading far inland underneath the ice to rot it from beneath. And that's changing the entire ecosystem underneath the edge of the so Antarctic Sheet. So there's no place to go unless we leave Earth. Well, even then, there's no possibility that we're going to leave the Earth, not in the time frames we're talking about. Even in the long-term time frames, reality, we would not leave the Earth. We might send descendants off to go colonize elsewhere, but the reality is we would not en masse be going. And so our home is here. This is the place we must protect. Can we send Trump to some other planet? Uh, I try not to go places <laughs> like that. All right, let's, let's look. 
I had a uh, couple of questions here, and <clears throat> you can take me where you want to go with this. Sure. Climate change has finally begun to be discussed by our politicians, so where are we now? What has happened since we last talked? And since we last talked, uh, we've, we've talked more about climate change now in this particular interview. At first, firstly, it is hugely heartening that the politicians have finally at last begun to talk about the problem. Are they talking about it? The politicians, are they getting... So when we first talked about having this show, that was a question I suggested, and part of the reason was it was heartening to see that a lot of the politicians, particularly in the Democratic Party, were very much talking about climate change, and there was a big push towards having a debate about climate change. Yeah. And they talked about it a little bit in the first two debates, but the main part of the Democratic Party, the DNC, has adamantly opposed having climate change or climate be a major factor in the debates. And so the party itself has pushed away from having that as being a major discussion. So where I saw a promise before, I'm not so sure now. Uh, in theory, there will be two discussions about climate on September 4th and a couple of weeks later, and we'll see where they go, but very much the, the powers that be in the parties don't want to talk about it, and Why particularly they the want Republican to? Party. Why do they, don't they want to? Because it'll do away with the profits from the extractive industries? For the folks on the nominal right of the spectrum, the Republican Party and, and related, that's, I think, precisely it. That it, it ends up impacting profits in the near term very strongly. For the folks on the left of the party, I think the same thing is largely true, but even more, they see it as something that, for, from their perspective, I suspect, everybody who is strongly in favor of doing something about climate change, from their perspective, is already going to be voting on their side. And so there's nothing to gain of trying to win somebody from the other side so they don't want that debate. I think that's wrong. When you look at what the, pu what the public thinks, by huge margins, the public is concerned and the public wants action. But that's not represented in our politics. Right, but where is the money? And the money is a huge problem, particularly the money that was involved ever since we had a Supreme Court decision that allowed unlimited money in politics in terms of advertising and other things, and essentially being able to shield it behind anonymous, um, I think they're, I forget what the number is that they use, there's a particular code in the law where a lot of the organizations can hide where their money comes from. Yeah. And what it does is it substitutes the idea that money is speech for speech being speech. Yeah. And that was a dramatic shift in our politics, and it, it's a terrible thing, frankly. Massive fires in Siberia, Canada, Alaska, and even Greenland. We've already touched on that. Mm -hmm. What does those indications of climate change mean to all of us? It means the melting of the Arctic is happening far faster, we've always said that, than any, any of the models predicted, and that has consequences both in the near and long term. And so, so this is where we get into one of the huge issues. The international group that has particularly focused on climate is the International Pla Panel on Climate Change. Yes. This is scientists and, and representatives from governments from all over the world. Part of the ground rules of their discussions is they only do science that's got at least 10 years behind it, meaning all the stuff that's happened in the last 10 years isn't involved in their modeling. So everything we've learned in the last 10 years and all the dramatic shifts that have occurred are not in there. Delay factor. There's a delay, and what it does is it dramatically then understates what the risks are. Also, you end up having to get whatever's approved in terms of language past the political people from all the countries involved. And all it really takes is one big member to say no, and everything grinds to a halt, and one, things are not set. One big member being the U.S.'s influence. At the moment, it is primarily us. You know, a couple of years ago it wasn't, but now it is. But also China and India and Russia and others. And it becomes a really great difficulty for the scientists to get the politicians to come along, and it's a slow process. Unfortunately, climate change is happening faster than that process. And the kind of things that it does is, when you look at the predictions they have of what's necessary in order to keep us from going to a two degree centigrade additional warming, mm -hmm one degree more than where we are now, 
is it requires that we essentially stop emitting carbon dioxide to the atmosphere within a decade. But if we're going to do that, that requires that we reduce every year 10% of what we're making now, every year from now till then. When the, the we we're talking about now is humankind. The we is everybody. And particularly it means the industrial nations. And so ah. the, the economies in the industrial nations are based on fossil fuels. We can convert about 3% a year to other sources. And that's about the rate of growth as well. They happen to be about the same size. What we can't do is convert 10% a year just doing what we're doing now. It requires everybody working together with f every effort we've got to do it. And even then, it's dramatic shifts in our economy. But that requires everybody doing it. And if any big player doesn't participate, it requires everybody else to do more. It's hard to see that we will in any way be able to maintain no more than a two degree C rise. And so that means, okay, we're going to go to three degrees C or maybe four, and those seem vastly more likely. Uh, potentially, you know, if you look at the rates that we'd have to reduce carbon emission to stay at four degrees C, that's probably in the realm of doing, uh, of something we could do. But, again, you've got to have the commitment of everybody to do it, and we don't have that. Which means we're likely going to blow through four degrees C as well. And by the time we get there, by the time we get to three degrees C, we're in a world unlike anything we've ever known. And everything changes. But everything changes, and this time something will happen uh, to change the outcome of what's going on. Is, is there going to be some uh, natural calamity, or like a meteor, or uh, something naturally occurring? Or is it going to be uh, caused by humans directly, more directly? My best guess is nothing will happen and we will simply go through the catastrophic change. There are things that could happen that might slow it down. You know, before we came on air, we were talking about the current conditions between Pakistan and India yeah. over Kashmir. Mm -hmm. All it takes is for them to get out of control and have a three-way nuclear exchange between Pakistan, India, and China. And just with a thousand nuclear weapons going off, it would dramatically alter the climate of the Earth for decades at least. Well, I'm looking at the uh, situation in uh, Iran now, and Israel and that whole Middle East thing. Is that going to be uh, superseded by Kashmir and Pakistan? The Kashmiris are caught in the middle, and, but the battle is a three-way one with China, India, and Pakistan. Oh, my God. And they, you know, mutually assured destruction still works. It's craziness, but it still works. And none of them wants to end their own existence, and so that's why it works. But they, there are enough folks who are crazy enough to potentially start it. And once it starts, I don't think you can stop it. Uh, if you looked at the Middle East, the different one between Iran and the United States and others, yes, Iran. Uh, that one would become probably an asymmetrical war there have been seven or eight or more um, war games that the United States has played involving the, the Iranian Gulf or the Saudi Gulf, however, which, whichever name you choose to use. And in every one of them save one, the United States lost. And the reason was that the Iranians could use asymmetrical warfare and essentially take out our fleet in the Gulf. But what ends up happening is part of that kind of asymmetry is we might actually resort to using a nuclear weapon, particularly now. Well, the Iranians, needless to say, would not be um, quiet about that, mm -hmm. and likely their first thing would be to draw, destroy all the oil terminals in the other countries of the Gulf. Almost immediately, the entire oil supply of the world gets cut in half. Well, what about the nuclear situation on the North uh, Sea and, and Russia? <laughs> so. So we were competing now uh, uh, systems whereby we self-destruct. So are you talking about the nuclear reactor? That yes, they, yes. Yeah. So in far northern Russia, they were testing what appears to be a nuclear cruise missile. Mm -hmm. This is something the United States did 50, 60 years ago, 70 years ago. And we figured out that it was craziness, that essentially what you end up with is a nuclear reactor that has no shielding in order to make it light enough to power a cruise missile. Well, when you do that, the radiation field from it is intense. 
And what it does then is all you have to do is just fly it back and forth over the enemy's territory, and it has something like a five-mile kill swath underneath it. <laughs> you don't need to detonate anything, just fly it, fly it around. Well, likewise, wherever you take off from, there's a problem. But one of the things the United States had is when we tested a lot of these nuclear rocket engines, they were both for rockets as well as cruise missile when they developed them. And at least in one case, they lost 30% of the core out the exhaust as they ran the reactor. 30%. 30%. Oh. It basically eroded in the, in the hot hydrogen gas. Um, it's a really tricky thing to do, and even if you do it right, whatever that is, the result is absolutely horrific. Dirk, we have got to stop now <laughs> because we're running out of time. And we're just getting started, sure. and that's how it always is with us, you know. <clears throat> but uh, I want you to look at the camera <laughs> and tell the viewing audience what they're seeing, what we've been talking about, and any other message that you have that would be useful for them and for us. Well, I think the biggest one is that the world is an amazing place, and mm -hmm. it truly is glorious. Get out and explore it and know it. Appreciate it. Love your neighbor figure out how to spread that and, f and find ways that you can help to change our body politic to solve these problems. And it isn't through opposition. It has to be with working with your neighbors and friends and family. It's the only way we've ever solved anything. Politics, yeah. Body politic, changing the body politic. All right, so we're going to have to shut down now before I get yelled at by the control room. <laughs> and we have a try. Oh. Uh, thanks for watching, and remember KFC, not Kentucky Fried Chicken, Dr. Don's KFC. Kind, <laughs> friendly, and charitable. Be kind. Be friendly and be charitable to you too, and you too, and you too, Indeed. and thanks again for coming on. You're just delightful. <laughs> <laughs> wow.